Okay, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to Reddy University of Applied Sciences' second annual virtual production gathering. My name is Stephen Payne, and I'm a senior lecturer here in the Creative Business Program for the Academy of Games and Media. And it's been a whole year since uh, we took the leap into virtual production with our inaugural virtual production gathering, uh, which was an online event with a few dozen people. And today, I welcome you to this event, uh, which is in person. And um, it's an in-person gathering of industry professionals, educators, and students. And all on our beautiful, brand new XR stage. We hope to continue to grow the virtual production gathering in the years ahead with more exceptional content and with shared experiences. Spearheading this effort is our first speaker, Carlos Santos, from Breda University's Cradle Research and Development Program. Carlos will outline the progress we've made to date within the virtual production and under his leadership and supervision. We, he will share with you details of our most recent virtual production project called Vessel, which was shot a mere two weeks ago on this very stage and is currently in post-production. Next up, we're happy to host Yasmin Najim from Painting Practice, which is an award-winning design studio working across film, broadcast, and advertising, and based in Cardiff, Wales. Yasmin will be discussing virtual production in pre-production, which is an often overlooked but essential tool. After lunch, we'll be joined online by your, uh, Jordan Thistlewood of Epic Games, developers of the newly released uh, Unreal 5 game engine. Jordan will discuss filmic storytelling through games technology. After that will be Roloff Bauman of Rovisual, providers of our beautiful LED wall and generous partners for our university. Roloff will present working with LED in virtual production technology. Our next speaker also comes to us online from ARI. Stefan Solner will discuss usage of ARI cameras in virtual production environments. And lastly, Noah Kadner will join us online from Los Angeles as our keynote speaker. You may know Noah by virtue of his insightful 2009 publication, Virtual Production, Feel, uh, uh, the Virtual Production Field Guide, a beautifully curated collection of interviews and insights developed during the earliest days of virtu uh, virtual production techniques. Noah will speak to us about new workflows and new opportunities in virtual production. I'll close this brief introduction with a couple of housekeeping announcements. Guest Wi-Fi has been set up. You can see the credentials uh, at the, uh, the top of the screen. So please feel free to sign in. Coffee and drinks will be available in the sports bar next door, as will a buffet lunch served at noon. And don't forget to join us uh, for our networking and drinks event as we officially launch the XR stage shortly after our final speaker. On behalf of Breda University, we would like to thank all of our sponsors listed on screen. And we hope today to inform you, to excite you, but most of all, to inspire you with new possibilities and new perspectives. So now let's uh, start with our first speaker, Carlos Santos. Thank you. 
for joining us. The idea behind the virtual production gathering is to start the community around virtual productions, to get everybody that's interested in this field or is curious about it to start communicating. That's why we would like to have this physical gathering. Um, as such, I would like to talk about our journey. Actually, a lot of people are asking me how we started with virtual productions. This is something, a step that a lot of people are interested, both in education and industry. And uh, there is some time investment that needs to be done, and there's a lot of money investment that needs to be done. So they are obviously curious and careful. And that's sponsored or, or, or motivated my, my presentation today, how we started on this journey um, a bit. So a bit about myself. Um, I'm Carlos. I'm Portuguese. I have 22, 23 years of experience. I worked in the industry for a very long time on something completely different, which is critical software. I developed software and had teams working with me on multiple software for airplanes, satellites, and other things. I really fed up with that industry, so I moved on and actually joined here. And the idea was coming to, to Breda and working on the university and do a sabbatical for about a year and then move on back to the industry. And I love it so much that I kept saying, so I'm here for 10 years. Uh, and meanwhile, I did a bunch of different things, including working as a lecturer, but also as a researcher, and that's what I'm doing now. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work in artificial intelligence, uh, user games research, but also user experiences, augmented reality, uh, virtual productions, and hyperrealism. So th those are the main areas of, of research of my own personal interest. Um, and I've worked in multiple fields, and to be honest, I like it. I like it very much. That's why I'm not planning to move anytime soon. Um, anyway, uh, so the start of a journey. I have to put a bit of the context where we are here in the Games Academy, or actually the, the Bread and Virtual Applied Sciences. I'm actually part of the Academy for Games and Media, which has three strong pillars, okay? The media um, programs, which has a master and a bachelor, which actually sponsor of multiple facets of the media industry. They have the business side, they have the marketing side, but also have the production side, including radio, the creating the studio productions with cameras, and they actually teach the students that type of, of, of information. The games program, um, actually is also multifaceted side. We actually teach multiple variations or multiple sides of the games development, from programming to uh, visual arts, but also talking about uh, the production side, the design side, to actually have multiple uh, capabilities to actually produce really AAA games. Uh, and we are very passionate about our programs because we see this as creating professionals that can join directly to industry. And we're very, very um, glad with the success we've been having last years with those programs. Um, in the middle, we also have a very strong research uh, line. It's not very well known because we are a, a Hochschule and or applied university school, but we have really been very successful in our research program, which sits exactly in the middle of those two, which actually have multiple uh, professorships, both in media concepts, but also in entertainment applied games. And we've been developing very strongly long, big projects around them. So big that we actually have our own R&D team. Been having now, starting Monday, <laughs> with, with uh, the last member joining this, our crew this year, 14 people working just on research and development, plus the researchers on top. So this is actually a very strong effort that we've been having to actually emphasize and, and, and strengthen our research team, but also our development capabilities to develop products and uh, uh, research products that actually can be developed on. So our story starts more or less there. I was working on a project, on one of our latest projects called uh, VIVE, which it has to stand for virtual humans uh, for medical applications, and we've been strongly working in um, Unreal Engine. So we've been working for this for two years, we've been developing a full pipeline for creating an alternative, what they call meta-humans, that you've probably heard or seen from Unreal. We actually developed everything here ourselves from scratch, and we started just before virtual humans or, or meta-humans came, and actually we have an alternative setup. And this has been the work we've been developing strongly with our own team, and we obviously been very casually or, or, or up, uh, up to date with news what Unreal is capable, so I was very curious about virtual productions, and I approached Steven. 
Steven is one of our lecturers um, and responsible for our multi-camera studio with a chroma key wall. So I told him, can we do something? And that's exactly when we started. We, we started getting this interest between us of let's try to see if we can gather something. We maybe we can get some intern students, maybe some extracurricular activities, and we form our first guild. A guild is a space that we have in university, very old, taking, taking the note of the Renaissance guilds. Basically, it's a space where our it's a space where we have the possibility to interact with other people and share knowledge. It's from the people who are just interested in knowing, getting a bit of this notion of how does this work, how does this uh, uh, support each other, and start creating this content and knowledge overflow to each other so we can actually share and create something. So we started our guild, we put some announcements, we get some interest from students, and we start having online meetings. This is during Corona period, so we, most of the meetings were actually done online. We organized our own main content online, and we're very lucky to actually be joined by Nord University and Greg Kurda. Uh, Greg is actually from Norway, is working on a university in, um, in Norway, uh, in Nord, and she is starting to join us. Greg, thank you very much. <laughs> You've been really part of the process since the beginning. Um, and, and basically, it's basically become a guild that is not only university focus and maybe games and media students focus, which actually was quite unique in our own setting because normally the programs are quite independent. And it becomes also ex external, starting to become more related outside. So we start tinkering, we start creating small content, we start playing around with main, playing with and having a real engine, um, uh, uh, being captured and combined and do, do, do a bit of the compositing using green screens in our very small uh, multi-camera studio. So what I'm gonna show now is actually our first production. It's not very good, okay? But it's also to show you where we started. So, um, when we build this and created this production, there was a bunch of different logistical challenges. First, this was our first time doing it, so we, don't, we didn't know what we were doing. Second, all of this was extracurricular activities. We were doing this on our own time. This was not graded, so all the students that were actually joining us was just for pure interest. And there is that possibility of doing that in-house, and we actually motivate our students to pursue that, but that also limits because it's based on their free time. Um, the studio at the time was actually very busy. Normally, some of our students actually fly abroad to Flagstaff in the US or to UK to actually spend some time um, doing an outside of campus uh, training where they actually train different things in terms of studio, because our studio facilities are quite limited here, and we actually motivate the students to actually become international, talking with other people, talking with other uh, things. So we, every year, our media students, or part of them, go abroad. Because of Corona, that didn't happen. So the studio was extremely busy, and we had very limited access to the, to the studio. And we had no budget, or very low budget, and very minimal equipment that we started. Uh, so this were mainly the logistical challenges, but also we didn't shy off of a bunch of different technical challenges, which basically we did camera tracking, we did real-time compositing, because we didn't know how to do post-production, uh, we did multi-layer um, uh, um, compositing, and we did synchronous sliced light, uh, light transition, so when the cart goes in the tunnel, lights transition, 
uh, and we had animated sinking characters. Like, why did we did this big of a step? It was too much, but we did it, and it was fun. It was really fun to do it. Um, lessons learned, our space was really, really small. That limited our tracking. The camera tracking space, it was literally two and a half meters by one and a half. It was really small, and lighting, lighting is really hard. <laughs> That's, if you have learned something, there's something really wrong with that hair. If you see it, it has a bunch of green tint on it. And this is because of the wall and the lighting settings that we had. Basically, our wall, it's a green wall, but we have to make it uniformly green, so we have to light it properly. That means that we have what we call chroma spill, which is this lighting that bounces from the wall and reflects back. So every white surface, every reflective surface, you're gonna be noticing that. And we can do a lot of post-production work to actually fix that, do color correction and all of those things. But to be honest, we didn't have the manpower to do it and that's how it became. Um, but also, um, it's, we noticed that audio, it's incredibly value. Like when you have the train moving and we have all these things going and you have the posts going by and going into the tunnel, it really creates this environment. And Greg, once again, he's been our sound engineer and audio engineer because he's been working really hard. The other thing we've noticed is that the depth of field, we have to work much, much better on it. To have a bit of an idea on actually how we build it, um, we, this, this setting we had, we had just actually put the rails of the dolly on the, on the ground. We put the dolly on top with a cart. We actually had a lever that literally shake it the, the, um, the, the rails and everything bobbed a bit. That gives us the motion of the train. And afterwards, we just composite everything in real time. That's how we shot it. So it's gonna be showing a bit. So Theodore here uh, is actually shaking the rails and we do the composite with three layers. So we have the background, the main composite and the, what we capture from the camera and the front layer uh, in Unreal, do it done in real time. This is actually what we got and very little was done afterwards for this. Um, meanwhile, we started creating the virtual predictions gathering that Stephen mentioned. Um, the idea about the virtual predictions gathering is to actually get more people involved. We saw that this is great. We saw a lot of people that was going through the corridors and start seeing what we've been doing. Very interested in knowing more and getting a bit more involved, but didn't know exactly what virtual predictions were. So basically we said, well, let's arrange a small set of guest lectures about virtual productions, make like a small event around it, get some people involved, some students involved, uh, and we did some announcements internally. And we noticed not only internal people joined, but a lot of externals. And we didn't announce it, we didn't put it out there, we didn't say anything about this to others. And we have people from Singapore to Austria and from Germany joining us, and we're like, what's happening here? <laughs> So we said, well, maybe it's a good way for us to encourage, it's a really good encouragement. It's a good uh, way for us to get feedback. And I think the community around virtual production does not exist in this part of the world. Let's start it. Let's see if we can go. And that's one of the big mo motivators that we got at the time to actually continue, but also to, to have a, a place for us to grow internally. And we start wall searching. Um, we thought that if you want to continue this path, we probably want to have to look at creating a bigger wall, having this proper volume set up. So we went to management, we, we went to management, saying we need a wall and the space and this and that, this and no, <laughs> no. So we discussed budgets, we discussed options, we went for companies, we got starting to get quotations for walls and starting to get information how that would be possible, where we can host it and we got lucky, really lucky. Rue Visual was the partner we were looking for and they were, they're extremely, we are extremely grateful for whatever they're providing to us. They are top notch uh, technology. They have 100% guaranteed assistance. They're always there for us. And at the moment they're being great because they will not only be able to supply a lot of our equipment, they actually sponsored a lot of our equipment as well. Um, so we had an agreement with them. Whatever we create here would be able to be used also for their marketing. We all, whatever uh, knowledge that we gather would be helpful for them. 
but that's very little compared to what they offered us. And I'm really grateful of what they provide. Um, so actually, we started this work of actually creating the wall you see in front of you. Um, we still had to do a lot of the work. We actually had to do and fit the room itself because this was white with nice paintings and we painted black. People are not very happy about that. Uh, we actually had to figure out what a 63 amp uh, power supply is uh, and how we uh, have to put it in because actually there's not such capabilities here and we actually have to create a new landline for have that power capabilities here. Uh, we had to look into PC and computer requirements, the trust system, uh, the ballast to hold the wall, the, the installation and scheduling, all of those things for cranes and other things. And that was just setting things up here because the work started afterwards uh, when we actually have to learn uh, how to operate the wall. Again, Rue Visual would been amazing to help us installing all this on spot and took us about uh, two and a half days to get everything up and running. So, this was the first step of our journey. Now things are becoming a bit more serious. We had a wall, we have to learn how to use it. And our motto is learn by doing it. And again, we were very lucky with our ability to connect with the industry and we got hold of Iron Films. Actually, they got a hold of us. Uh, Iron Films been an amazing partner with us. They've been helping us learning how to use this properly because they have a lot of experience with it. But also, they've been joining our guild every week, giving feedback to our students, giving us the possibility to actually work, get their feedback as industry and their learning moments to actually support our work uh, in, in, in our students are directly in contact with them whenever they need. Also, we started a new project called Vessel. Uh, Vessel is a 2021-2022 year-round project. Uh, we have media students and game students working together to create a movie, a short film. Um, it's going to be from script to publishing, and it's gonna be a year-round project, and they have to do everything. They have to develop their environments, they have to work on the characters, they have to develop the vehicles, they have to create and have and manage all the production, they have to do uh, actor hiring, costume, uh, set building, sound, managing budge, budgets, including a GoFundMe, uh, and lighting, filming, everything. This is the best way for them to learn, because they have to be involved with the full process. So this is something that we currently are going on. It's something that we have actually been developing. We have students actually working with us and we're really proud, well, if he finishes it, that we're gonna have the first virtual production savvy students graduating this year, okay? Which will already have about a year and a half of experience of doing virtual production. This is more or less when we started. So I have some insights of what we already have. It's still in production, we still don't have a lot to, to show, but the filming that we did here, I already have some insights to show. One of the things that is, the wall is great. <laughs> I can tell you that. It's not everything though. Um, for example, hard shadows is something that is gonna be, di it's difficult to create with lighting, because we have really big panels and diffuse a lot of the lighting. So hard shadows are really hard to come by and you still have to use um, extra lighting and then traditional studio lights to actually provide that feedback and that, that, that information. So we actually, on this setting, well I should play it because you can actually see what I'm talking about. In this setting here, we actually use a lot of the panels that we have on the side to actually create this rim light. We have this really reddish uh, environment and we want to have this environment where she have the wall providing that feedback. The thing is there is this hard shadow still happening and those need to be provided by extra studio lights.
Lighting is hard, but I can disclose a bit of our process, what we figure out works for us at the moment. So the best way that we, can, we tackle um, lighting is mainly we start with looking at the ceiling, having a uniform lighting, and compensate that with studio light. So we basically set up and start with, we had a set here, and we put uh, the, the talents uh, in front, we uniform the light to have this tone already, and we compensate that with a harsh light or more strong lights on the spot, on the spot so we have a bit more the, the, the shadows there. And then we uh, work that part. And then afterwards, we looked into the virtual side, all the background on the real scenes, and then we start compensating that. So we start to matching the Unreal Engine uh, virtual scene to what we saw on the front to get that uniform look to it. So that was mainly our process of doing it. At this specific uh, setting, you're gonna be seeing this bobbing of the light. That's actually, we can do that through two ways. We can do it through DMX controls, which actually have man, uh, automatic control over the light. Or if it's not difficult to reach or not difficult to match, literally have someone moving the light in intensity at the moment, that's exactly what Al is doing here. Uh, to actually match this bobbing of the light that we see in the background, we see the virtual scene there bob, um, changing the, the light intensity, and she's doing the same thing manually with the lights, and it works quite well. The other thing is that we also use it as a green wall. Um, so this is another scene where we have this monster coming up because game students love monsters and we have to include them in every single production that we create. Um, but this time around, when we actually went to the studio, everything was set up, everything was ready, the character was not ready. Uh, it didn't have fur. So the fur problem, we had a fur problem because it was not fully developed. We still filmed it and we still showed the actor what, how it looks like, but actually we refilmed it afterwards um, also with the green wall. And you can already see the difference between what we have here as the green content and what we had before. All the lighting on him is still the same as the, the other one. So there's no spill, chroma spill anywhere because the wall itself is emissive, so we don't have to relight it, so we do not have to cast it, and we can actually control exactly how much it is there, so it's much easier. And actually this scene will be used probably in multiple years to come to teach our students how to do post-production, because it's just an empty canvas for our students to actually use this as a starting point to test different types of post-productions, because you can just put anything there, it's just someone getting scared of something. Um, this is another scene that I really, really like. Uh, it's probably, in my opinion, the best scene that we did. Um, this is mainly what, the reason why volumes and LED, LED volumes are so good. Um, the main thing is the reflections. So if you look carefully on the glasses or the reflective surface on the helmet, but also on the wall, and we can see it's running a bit, you're gonna be able to notice that you're gonna see a lot of reflections. This is something with green screens is really hard to do. The reason is that if you have the surface being reflected, you actually can see the scenery directly on their helmet, but also on their jacket, on their, uh, on their uh, helmet, that you're gonna be seeing the lighting actually adjusting correctly to what we have. And that's actually really hard to do with green screens because literally what we have is, is the incapability of doing that normally uh, without a lot of post-production. What we did here was simple. We built a window, a framing window with, uh, with just some, some wood and some plexiglass. Um, and we had an unreal scene that we spin around with some velocity because it was out of focus and it didn't matter. The idea of the spin around is that we have this idea of this mountains and hills, so we can have different ele elevations of um, elevations of the um, of the, the the color scheme that we see on the, the character. Um, we have matching with the ceiling, and we just filmed it, and it was that easy to create this type of scene, which with other techniques would be really, really, really hard to do. This was another scene that we created that we feel particularly proud of. 
which is uh, this shot. And I'll try to give you a challenge, which is, can you figure out where the real prop set ends and the virtual scene begins? So this thing particularly is quite interesting for us because it's basically how we transition from a real scene which is focusing on the foot of the talent and move to a completely virtual scene. And if you notice, it's actually quite hard to detect. I know where it is because <laughs> we were building it, but for most people it's really hard and on a movie scene or on a short film, it's gonna be really hard to do. Um, we actually use a specific technique called photogrammetry. Well, our students and our lecturers did. Um, which we have a lot of experience using photogrammetry. Again, we have our characters that we develop for, with photogrammetry. We've been quite um, known about this type of technique. We actually take a lot of pictures and create 3D models. So we actually took props that we had on the set, like bones and branches, and we scanned them. We actually took a lot of pictures of them, create 3D models out of them, and then we integrate them directly on the real engine scene. Means that the sets, the props that we had on, the real props that we had on the set, were also there. It actually creates quite a nice blend because you don't see a big difference because it, it's the same thing. Maybe a different position, maybe different things. Will people not notice that it's the same thing? But it's another technique that we, we used and it was quite, quite successful. Um, the other thing that we had some interns working on was a light management tool. One of the problems that we had is that our media students, which have not a lot, uh, not a, uh, have a not a, uh, sorry, have a lot of knowledge about lighting and lighting the studio and controlling the lights, actually don't know in real. It's a tool that is completely alien for them. So telling them search for this light and change the color it's something really, really hard for them. So we actually created a prototype of a tool for doing light management. Um, and the way it works, you can play it, it's very simple. It creates a side view, an outliner view of actually all the lights that you have, all the virtual lights you have in the scene, and you can reorganize them the way you want. Not only can you organize them as, as the way you want, you can group them. So you have, for example, the stair spotlights, you have the crystal lights, and you can control them independently, and you give them very simple controls that they know how to use, and they can adjust them. It's quite interesting, because that became a very useful tool for the people that didn't were aware of it, and be able to just control the lights. Okay. Not only that, we actually hook up this with DMX lights, meaning that they're not only able to do this for the virtual lights on the scene, they actually could, if they needed to, for this presentation we didn't do it, for the previous one we did, we actually could look up this with real DMX lights and create presets. The advantages of this tool also is that you can save different light, set, um, uh, light setting, meaning that you can have a light setting for day and just create another mood or another tone and do a night scene. And then you have just on a press a button and on loading on a different set button, you could have this ability to just load different uh, light settings. Um, this is great also because you can also go to the director of, of photography and present them different alternatives and you can adjust them in real li uh, time and save a new light setting. So it's a tool that we hope that we get some investment in and some love in getting some more uh, work so we can actually can develop this and make it this open source and available for everybody. So this is a bit of where and where we are now. Now we want to move to the future and where we are going to so we can have a bit of the feeling of that. So we are looking into creating what we call the XR lab. The XR lab is basically a space where we're going to develop virtual productions more, and actually has more or less three pillars. I'll present them a bit. The first thing, and then maybe the open announcements that we currently have a program called Creative Media and Game Technology, which has three variations. 
pro programming, visual arts, and design and production. Now, from 22, 23, we're gonna open a new variation called film and special effects or visual effects. Um, it's gonna start in 23, 24 because we have to follow national uh, rules. We cannot do it for an already next year, um, but it's gonna be a four year curriculum. Uh, we'll have about 50 students of cohort every year, um, and we're gonna train them in professional roles around filmmaking for studio operations, virtual productions, environmental arts, cinematography, lights and color, uh, motion capture, photogrammetry, studio and cinematography as a, as a whole. Um, we are gonna be doing still one large production per year, hopefully already next year as well. And I'm really glad that Theodore is gonna be our first graduated student on media that has a lot of that knowledge. And hopefully some of the students will follow up afterwards. So we have some other intern students that have been helping us out doing the production work understanding how does this work and they will probably graduate next year and we hopefully have already a starting flow of students with these capabilities already to industry starting already this year. The research link. We don't want to discourage our research link. Um, that is really important for us. That's what I and my team working on. So that's something that we want to continue working on and the motion capture part is gonna be something that we are planning to develop more. So our tracking capabilities here is uh, quite limited, also strong, but quite limited. And we want to develop ability to track the camera more consistently. But also, we want to expand that to motion capture. We already have motion capture capabilities. Uh, we have four excellent <laughs> suits that we use for doing motion capture, but we want to extend that to multiple things. So that's gonna be our next um, investment, I think. That's at least what my management keeps saying to me. <laughs> um, the other thing is we want to continue our tool development. We wanna have, I think this light management tool is something that we feel that it will be a very good benefit for industry, making everything easier. Uh, we've been discussing with APEC the possibility of working with them in other companies as well to make this as part of their tool set maybe working towards working with other companies and make this happening. So this is currently what we are looking at is, is to make sure that this prototyping tool that we have, still a bit rough around the edges, but it works. We saw it, the utility of it. So we wanna see if this reaches out to the open source, uh, making it open source and reach out to the, the industry and have other people working and using it. We already have a redesign of how it will look we already have an ability to know what works and what doesn't work. We wanted to push it to also post-process volumes because that's something that's really interesting. And I think it's, the, it's quite useful when we're doing this type of work. Um, so that's, that's our bet. But also we want to look into uh, publishing, uh, publishing production documents. We've been using a lot of documents, believe it or not. Thank God from our production students that can help us out with the process, the, the shot list, the, the call sheets, the, all of those things are hard. And more, some of the industry already have them, other ones don't. I'm not saying we do it the best way ever, but we have them. So you don't have to come up and start from scratch. So if you make them published, maybe, maybe public, maybe you can actually use some of those resources because it will be easier for our students in the future when they graduate, they can bring that knowledge back to the industry as well and just use the same processes that we have here. Again, can be changed, can be altered. It's whatever is required from your own particular part. Um, then external link. We've been working with Rue. We've been working with Iron Films. We've been working with Epic. We've been working with Nord uh, as an educational institute. And there's a lot of others starting to reach out as well. Um, we want to create long-term partnerships. We want to share resources. We want people to use our facilities. We need to, we want to us to connect and know and understand the skills, but we also want to share it. That's why we are an educational institute. We don't have a good, um, um, or we don't have a, a, a ideal setting for getting money out of this. We know our business is literally training professionals. So that's what we are hoping to get from industry, and that's why we created the Virtual Productions Gathering, is to start this community. And hopefully, 
will be the leading motivators from them because this is also on our own interest because our students will be working on it in two or three years time. That, that's the idea behind it. So you want to spark that, that trust, that, that ability to have companies collaborating, talking, and we hopefully be part of that, that change. So in short, we're gonna start an educational program on this area. Hopefully we can continue working on this uh, research side and publish and making share our knowledge. And we hope to get the industry involved on this. So please get involved. That's basically our message. Um, so today I'll talk about how we started. Don't do giant steps like we did. It's maybe too much. Uh, mistakes are part of the journey. Recognize them, deal with them. It's part of the process, but learn by doing. That's the only way, that's how we teach our students, is just do it and you learn with your mistakes. Um, communication is really key, that's why also here, you want, that's why we want virtual protection gathering to become something that will be every two years, maybe every year, depending on how we want to do it, and if I am able to do this frequently, uh, because it was a lot of work. Um, we are starting the, a lab specifically for this, for supporting new education and to be able to uh, collaborate and share with others. And please, questions. This is where I ask you to just throw out questions because that's what we're here for. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Where's the mic for questions? Well, then, I just... <laughs> Is there any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Meanwhile, I try to, to give some time between speakers. I told speakers to talk about 45 to 50 minutes to make allow for you guys to actually do questions. That's why we try to be all here. Oops. Um, I, think we, I think it's here. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you want to um, uh, expand the capabilities of uh, the motion capture. You already mentioned you had accent suits. Yeah. Um, um, I, I think I noticed you're using uh, five trackers now for the camera tracking. Yes. Um, so what kind of solutions are you looking at? What, what, what do you think you're going to be using? So um, I actually reach out to a lot of different companies for, for camera tracking. Uh, we approach Moses, we approach OptiTrack, we approach Vicon, TrackMan. So we, we track multiple options at the moment. We are currently negotiating with different companies. Um, the current um, talks that I'm having strongly, uh, also with management, is, is going to, for Vicon, uh, but we are not discarding at this point any other solution. But we hope to get and combine this space, because it's quite open space, also to do motion capture, to actually embed um, inside our tracking, so having specific cameras that track specific trackers. Um, and not opt for something like a Star Trek or something. We have like this reflective service. That's the reason and the logic behind it, because we want to use the space as a multi-purpose space. We've been using this mainly for virtual productions, but this is actually a stage and be used for multiple options, right? So one of the things that you want to do is actually do a lot of other types of events here, like we're going to be demonstrating this afternoon, hopefully. Um, so we been here for talking about virtual productions, but we want to use this for multiple things. This is an open space for doing multiple events, and I think the inside-out tracking will be better suited for that. There's another question here. Um, first of all, can you hear me? Yeah. First of all, I mean, amazing work. It's uh, always so excellent to see the young generation sort of 
having such a creative energy in them and exploring all these new technologies. Uh, a couple of maybe more like technical question about the process. First of all, because you were talking a lot about post-production, right? Which is like, whether it's like classic filmmaking or real -time production filmmaking, everyone's like, well, like, let's fix everything in post. And then post is always there, like crying every night, <laughs> trying to figure out how to do things, right? So at what point were you thinking of, or did you pre-visualize things or will you pre-visualize things in other things? And so, another, sorry, just so I can get them on. And another question is, uh, when you were filming, uh, was the because of the spilling of the green screen, right? So was the could you control the intensity of the green screen? Because normally, depending from the cameras that you use, you can get some tools that with real time rendering show you how much green spilling is happening, and then adjust the intensity. So how did that work in that regard? So um, for the first question, how we uh, what were process uh, and how did pre visualization etc. So we started with the script, and then we moved quickly to what's possible, what's not possible, doing a bit of a pass on the technical side, and to create a shot list. Um, then we actually used Unreal Engine to create the shots. We started with literally pen and paper, just drawing it out, putting on a timeline, and then we start replacing with assets, and we have our um, real-time, uh, sorry, our game students creating already in the environments, landscaping, white boxing, so it's a very technical a term for, for games because you basically start building with a level and just put white boxes. This will be a church, and that will be, which is just a white box. And we're just creating a white box um, of, of things. We start creating uh, highlights uh, char uh, characters, and because everything is unreal, we start replacing assets. So we basically, oh, the asset is now uh, done or modeled, but not textured, just place it there. And everything in Unreal became the backbone of our development process. Uh, on that, that side, and we start building on top of it. Uh, when we film, etc., we had a really good uh, understanding of what the shot that we, we wanted, but also we had, uh, we, we reversed every single shot before the talent came in, so the pre-production side and the pre-vis was really important for us, um, because it, it's required, like the, the talent came in three days, we done all the shots, uh, we, we, we had everything prepared, the lighting was set up, the, the, um, the work was, was there, and they busy moved shots, and they were able to, move, to create like five or six shots per day. For the second question about the green spill, etc., we are amateurs at that point, so we didn't know what we were doing. Um, no, we didn't use any techniques, and we actually didn't have, had a lot of equipment back then, and uh, so, we, we, we were just winging it, literally. Um, we tried to adjust multiple settings and, and look at that. We also anal analyzed a bit of the green screen. We could already see it, that was gonna be a problem. But we were an extracurricular activity and like, let's just do it, otherwise we're gonna spend another two days or three days. And the student time was being used by, uh, by, by our students because of corona. We actually tripled the number of students that normally use that space and we had three days to do everything. So it's like the first way set up, second day, try it, fourth, uh, third day, shoot, that's it, and then we wrap up, and then that's all we had. Um, and, and luckily our intern students and Steven did a lot of that work, um, but for us it was a completely alien, alien process at the time. So yes, we could have done it 10 times better. But again, we did a lot of things at the time that we didn't know what we were doing, and I'm, I'm happy that we did it because we learned a lot. Um, more questions? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I would be really interesting to know uh, what are the links between uh, all the, the experiments, so to say, that you're doing uh, with this uh, media academy and the other academies here, but maybe also at other universities, because I see so many opportunities for, uh, for instance, health, wellness, but also tourism, uh, explorations or experiments, yes, so you know? So I can, I can specifically talk about that. So the first, th this space specifically, it's part of the building that is used for leisure and uh, event and leisure. That, that's the Academy for uh, Leisure and Events. And he's used this space as an open space. They have a stage, they have another 
uh, stress system with light setting, sound system, where they use it for events. And events like uh, theater, like um, live uh, music performances. And they're used to actually use that space for doing that type of work. And we're going to be talking about that a bit more on the XR launch. Um, the, the setting is that we're actually going to be using this for, yes, for all the academies. This is a public space. And even about, about a week and a half ago, I actually sat down with lecturers of um, leisure events and told them, like, this is what you can use the space for. You can do virtual tours. You can jump into India in an instant, and you have the feeling where you're there. You can actually go, because there's a lot of, a lot of um, uh, guided tours, like 360 tours, and you go to Efteling, and you can sit there and analyze why the restaurant is there, why is that, and actually have a breakdown of the environment with those students where they analyze those. So yes, we have a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of things we can do with this. So we are exploring those as well. Uh, it's not our field, so we are trying to connect with others, get the other ones involved, so they can explore them by themselves, and we can facilitate or we can jump and give the first instruction how to turn things on, how to connect the computer, and then they can explore the options by themselves. So that's, that's what we're currently doing. In terms of external connections with, uh, with other educational institutes, we've been talking with other educational institutes. We're open to it. We have a lot of people reaching out to us to come over, want to check, want to know how we did it. And that's why I also did a bit of this, this introduction of where we started, why we did it this way. And we see a lot of potential uh, opportunities for research, for education, for partnership. So we are open to it. OK, thank you very much. Any last questions? Harold. Thank you. Yeah, Carlos, I'm. Um, it's, it's super exciting, of course, for everyone to hear of the educational connections that are coming up. Um, I can imagine people in the audience here and watching online, um, teaching at other universities, perhaps thinking like, oh, wow, it sounds great, right? That you have groups of students from different curricula uh, working together on a big project, but then they start thinking along the lines of uh, teaching obligations, like formulating learning objectives and how do we measure whether certain competences are being learned and everything and how do we fit everything together? Um, and it might be quite daunting because, yeah, uh, that whole project-based learning setup then changes the way these teachers uh, help students learn, right? The whole format of education is changing. Can you reflect on that a little bit? What does it mean? Um, yes, I can. Uh, so it's a learning process also for us. It's a new process for us. But I think the goals are still there. The, 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 the goals are for the students is not about using the screen or using a specific camera or the setup. This is a tool. The screens is a tool that they use to create specific environments. Um, and there are other things that they also learn with this. The virtual shots that we create has nothing to do with the screens. And there's real shots, like when you film just the feet and stuff like we have that other shots, that has nothing to do with the screen. I think the goal is they learn the techniques, they learn the process. And yes, it's a challenge. It's a challenge for us because it's a new technique. Nobody knows how to use this properly. There's no big tools that allow us to just click a button and be done, maybe in a few years. But at the moment, there isn't. So just be critical about that. Understand that communication is key. It's about the production process. It's about the, air. the things are ready in the right time. If the, the assets are created, and make mistakes. Let them make mistakes, because that's how they learn. So um, I think that's the main focus of things. Uh, make sure that you get a good team of people that are encouraged and, and motivated to work on this, because that is half of the battle. Thank you. Any more questions? OK, thank you very much. Yasmin, I think you're first. <laughs>